Okay, for our final talk of the day, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Lean. Uh, so Ed joined the Allen Institute in 2004, and he played a critical role in uh, some of the early projects here, the, the big uh, mouse and brain atlas projects. Uh, recently, as co-lead, of the cell types program. Um, he spearheaded a really exciting and kind of unique collaboration with local um, neurosurgeons where we're able to um, uh, collect uh, pieces of, of cortical tissue from, uh, from uh, patients that are willing to, to donate that. And um, it comes into the institute and gets um, uh, used by a number of different uh, projects within the cell types program. And so um, Ed is here as, as uh, uh, a new part of the program, um, uh, a talk from an investigator to give us a kind of a, 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 a higher level view of, uh, in, in this case, the cell types program. So welcome, Ed. Right, well, thank you very much, Jim. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to give sort of this higher level overview and a synthesis of both the strategy and the progress that we've been making on the cell types program. Uh, this program has really made tremendous progress in recent years. Uh, and uh, in particular, I'd like to focus on our efforts to try to understand the fine architecture of the human cortex, uh, which has really presented a new set of challenges and opportunities. Uh, before we, I really get started on this, though, um, you know, we live and breathe here a mantra of big science, open science, and team science. And I want to start by acknowledging the contributions of everyone that's contributed to this. It's a remarkably large and talented group of individuals who all play key roles in making these projects happen. Uh, and they don't get enough recognition individually. Uh, I also do want to call out uh, some individuals, however, on the leadership of these programs. Uh, this effective teams are the result of, of very talented individuals who lead different elements of these projects. And I want to acknowledge from the top, Alan Jones and Christoph Koch for their high-level leadership. Hong Kui Zeng, with whom I co-lead this program, who sort of wears two hats, both as overseeing the mouse work and also as uh, the manager of structured science as a whole. Uh, and a whole series of individuals. We have a system of setting up sort of co-leads or even multiple leads um, of individual projects as part of the portfolio uh, who really work together very well and are responsible for the success overall. Uh, in a variety of different areas from molecular, anatomical, and physiological, connectional, uh, computational, and on the tools sorts of things as well. I also want to call out um, really the contributions of our local surgeons. Uh, really working with all of you, I think several are in the audience, uh, is what has made this possible to approach these new studies in the human brain. Uh, much of the work that I'll be describing was uh, the result of working with our first set of colleagues Jeff Ogeman, Andrew Koh, and Dirk Keen at the University of Washington, uh, Charles Cobbs and Ryder Gwynn at Swedish Hospital. Uh, more recently, we sort of expanded this work to the University of Washington Medical Center, thanks to the efforts of Rich Ellenbogen and Manny Ferreira, and starting to incorporate other surgeons as well, Dan Silbergeld, uh, soon Michelle Chowdhury as well. Uh, so we couldn't have done this without you. Uh, we really value your contributions to this work. So to give sort of a, a conceptual framework for the approach, uh, the, really, the, the essence of the project is to try to reverse engineer the neocortex. So as all of you know, this structure is responsible for most of our higher cognitive functions, also often referred to as the most complex piece of matter in the known universe. Uh, we wanted to try to, uh, to simplify this system into something which could be understood as, as a series of components and modeled, uh, sort of akin to an analogy of reverse engineering an electronic device where you try to understand its individual parts and try to understand how they're connected <coughs> and what they actually do. Uh, so to translate this into sort of an actionable plan, uh, we've taken the strategy of trying to first understand what the components are. In more biological terms, this would be the cellular taxonomy, uh, in particular using molecular approaches, as I'll, as I'll describe. Uh, once you understand the components, you can begin to start to understand the connectivity or the wiring diagram among these different components. Um, by virtue of taking a molecular approach, this leads directly to the identification of genes that allow you to create cell type specific tools. And all this information allows the building of models. And then hopefully, we'll get to the point where we can intersect the models and the tools and start to test 
uh, hypotheses about how the circuit functions and the role of specific cell types um, in that circuit. So I think really a, a key element to the success of where we are now in the human program was to group this together with the mouse. And we have a very parallel mouse and human program where we try to do as much as possible in the human uh, that's possible in the mouse, but using the mouse to sort of start the process of developing the methods and then seeing if we can adapt them to the human. Uh, I think from my own personal perspective, this is also like allows me to sort of use my jealousy of all the tools in the mouse to drive, sort of motivate being able to do these types of experiments in human as well, where we have such little information. And to that, uh, to that sort of aim, um, we put a lot of effort right up front into the preparation of tissues, uh, which is really a big problem with being able to do these studies. And have shown that uh, with adequate preparation of both post-mortem and surgical tissues, we can apply a whole suite of methods to actually study the human brain itself. Uh, and I'll describe some of these today, but these range from being able to do single cell, actually single nucleus transcriptomics, to be able to do living slice physiology experiments of single cells or multiple cells, as you heard this morning, uh, even up to uh, deriving virally-based genetic tools and moving into ultrastructure with uh, high throughput EM and array tomography. So, um, so you know, one of the one of the things that we've tried to do is to take a little bit of a different take on bounding the problem of diversity. The traditional strategy for doing this is based on anatomy, cellular anatomy, and physiology. And we, on the other hand, have a big, a long background in uh, in understanding gene expression. And so we asked can we use gene expression as the way to actually classify types, which conceptually is the code for, what, for all the properties of these cells, um, but also uh, provides the throughput and the information content that perhaps if we could look at enough cells, we would be able to derive a classification of types sort of akin to phylogeny, at least uh, sort of conceptually. So being able to take this approach uh, relied on the development of new single cell methods for being able to do transcriptomics. And Really, I think the best exemplification of this uh, was the first study by uh, Basilica Tasik and Hong Kui Zhang uh, to try to use this approach to stratify cell types in the cortex of a mouse by isolating populations of cells from a variety of different Cree lines, measuring all the genes expressed in those cells, put these together into a big unbiased classification, uh, and then look at the results. And the result from this first study um, was that there are 49 discriminable types of cells uh, in the cortex. And it's worth dwelling for a moment on the structure of this because this is really a, a very satisfying sort of result. On the one hand, uh, the first sort of split on the tree is non-neuronal cells versus neuronal cells. The next split is between excitatory cells and inhibitory cells. The next splits go by developmental origin of those cells or spatial location of those cells. So much of developmental biology, much of what was known about uh, cell types already, is well recapitulated and organized in a rational fashion that relates very much to the cytoarchitecture and to developmental origins of cells. <clears throat> uh, a running joke for some time was that, uh, was that there, in fact, were 42 neuronal clusters, which, as everyone knows, is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It's a stale joke here, but new, new audience. So. <clears throat> um, uh, however, uh, unfortunately, it's not the answer to the cortex. Um, so uh, Basilica and Hong Kui have extended these studies now uh, to try to see if we can sort of saturate this approach. You could imagine that if you do more cells, you just continue to get more diversity. Uh, but it turns out that, in fact, you do saturate eventually, um, running about 10 times the coverage of the original study. Uh, we come up with about twice the number of transcriptomic types. Most of these are now sort of over overrepresented. Um, so we think they think that we're largely plateauing, um, although perhaps not entirely. Uh, there are a few interesting elements to this uh, biologically. Uh, one is that the inhibitory neurons are common across the different areas, consistent with being generated in a single extracortical site of origin and migrating into the cell into the cortex whereas the excitatory cells actually vary significantly by region of the cortex in which they live, which is consistent from being generated locally along a cortical sheet uh, that has developmental gradients on it, for example. Um, so uh, so the, the bottom sort of line is, is the 
number of types seems to vary by region, but it's on the order of 100 types instead of 42. So a new answer to cortex, the universe, and everything. So a challenge for the, for the human is how to adapt this type of methodology and, and get a similar sort of take on cellular complexity. And this posed a problem because it's not easy to isolate living cells from adult cortical tissues. They don't survive the typical process of dissociation. Uh, so this forced us to go down a path of trying to use uh, nuclei as well <clears throat> instead of this. Um, we had a nice collaboration with uh, the labs of Roger Laskin and Richard Shoreman at uh, the Craig Venter Institute, who had uh, published the first results on being able to sequence the contents of nuclei. Uh, fast forward, we have established now that this method is very robust. Uh, it can be applied at scale in frozen postmortem tissues. So this is something that can be used in banked, banked postmortem tissues. And with very careful comparisons between whole cells and nuclei in mice, we can get a near identical result with these two methods. <clears throat> so applying now, this now to human, uh, we've tried to sort of run the numbers on human cortex as well. Uh, this is in the middle temporal gyrus, which will become apparent uh, why shortly. <clears throat> we ran about 15,000 cells here aiming for cells at a particular frequency in the cortex. And we derive a classification of types which are found across donors uh, and that vary, as, uh, as in the mouse, across different layers, across different types. Um, and the complexity is, is relatively similar, as I'll, as I'll get to in a moment. <clears throat> I did want to point out a, a few interesting uh, sort of elements coming from this, uh, from my perspective. Uh, the, the first is that in an ideal world, you might have genes which are very selective for a particular cell. And so we have sort of a one-to-one -one mapping and it makes a nice sort of path to driving genetic tools, for example. Uh, that does not turn out to be the case. Uh, most of these types are defined not by single genes, but by unique combinations of genes. So this will sort of in, uh, have consequences for deriving genetic tools. And also, if you look at the frequency here, an advantage of the nuclei as well is it seems to give a relatively unbiased sort of representation of cells. Uh, is that with a few exceptions of excitatory types, almost all neuronal types are rare. So this seems to be the makeup of the cortex. It is, uh, it is not simple. Instead, it is a, a few major types and many other cell components in very small proportions. <clears throat> so you might ask, um, how similar are the mouse and the human? And uh, you might have sort of made an assumption that the human would be significantly more complex a uh, somewhat egocentric viewpoint that uh, we run into quite a bit. Uh, but it actually turns out that, that the complexity is, is quite similar between the two species. Uh, so with a, with a number of caveats that I'd be happy to discuss at length uh, at, at another time, cells are nuclei, slightly different analysis methods, not the same cortical region. Uh, th what we're getting from the human is in the same ballpark as what we were getting from the mouse. So in the mouse, there are about 49 or 50 GABAergic types, uh, we're at 41 in the human, but we haven't saturated that actually. Glutamatergic is between 21 and 34, in human we're seeing 24 in this particular region. Uh, Non-neuronal is a little different, but there are reasons for the sampling in Cree lines. So the bottom line is the relative complexity and the general organization of the tree is actually extremely similar between species. So this seems to be quite conserved at this sort of gross generalization of a level. However, this is not to say that they're the same. And in fact, many of the details differ. Uh, I have a few examples here, but could have shown many, many others. Uh, at the level of, of the cell types, it's still actually difficult to map them one to one. At the level of individual genes, there are many, many genes that are very specific that vary between the species. So for example, here's an example I've, I've shown um, many times. This is a gene called prodynorphin. It's a pre-pro-opioid protein that in the mouse is expressed in a subset of GABAergic neurons, and the human is expressed in a very selective type of excitatory cell. This is not an, an uncommon sort of uh, finding to see shifts in, um, in cell type. Uh, if you take a different strategy and look at markers within a cell type that we can for sure match up one to one, you do see a number of conserved markers. This is an oligodendrocytes here. You also see a lot of divergent markers, and I picked this particular example because one of those genes that's quite divergent, it appears, is APOE, which is a well-known gene associated with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, this is really a bit of a cautionary note on, at the gene level um, for the, the sort of uh, relevance of a mouse 
uh, for studying uh, human diseases, or at least the need to understand uh, what elements are conserved and what are not. So, so the, the, the nice thing that I really want to emphasize from this um, molecular side of things is that it's bounded the problem of neuronal diversity. Up to this point, we really haven't understood how many types there are. If we just keep generating more data, will we get more types? When will we know that we're sort of finished? And by taking this sort of saturating type of approach, we have now a target. There are a number of molecular types, and we can start to ask the question of how these correspond to other phenotypes of cells. And furthermore, the gene expression in these clusters should, at least in principle, be predictive of the, of, of the properties of all of these types. So, uh, so the strategy sort of moving forward is can we, can we begin to connect these phenotypes together to establish the sort of relevance of these molecular types? And in the, um, in the mouse, this has now been going on for several years to take more of the morphoelectric approach to characterize different types of cells and quantitatively classify on that approach. <clears throat> this presented uh, quite a big challenge for working with human. Uh, and we have spent the last few years trying to establish methods for being able to do routine patch clamp physiology in slices that are derived from neurosurgical resections. That's the uh, thanks to all the neurosurgeons at the outset. <clears throat> and so essentially, uh, we're able to work with tissues which are re removed in the course of treatment for epilepsy or for removal of deep tumors where it's necessary to remove some tissue to get to the site of pathology. Those regions of cortex that are, are removed can be taken back to the laboratory. Uh, they can be sectioned on a vibratome as you would a piece of cortex from a mouse brain to yield 350 micron physiology slices. And then we can begin to do routine patch clamp physiology on these um, human slices. And one of, the, uh, one of the interesting things that's sort of come out of this, uh, I've described this a number of times now, uh, but uh, Jonathan Ting has a paper and review on this now, is that, is that these slices are extremely viable. So whereas you might have six or eight hours to do a, a mouse slice physiology experiment in an adult mouse slice, uh, these tissues can actually survive for several days. <clears throat> Here are some examples of recordings at 30 hours uh, post removal, or 48, or even 66, and Jonathan has now taken a more quantitative approach to uh, looking at whether properties change over this period of time. And most properties of cells that you're able to patch don't actually change significantly over uh, several days in culture. That's really quite remarkable. It's something quite different from the mouse. And in fact, you can keep these slices alive in culture for significantly longer than this as well. So what this has allowed is us to adapt the sort of high throughput standardized approach to doing patch clamp physiology that has been developed in the mouse to the human as well. And uh, so, uh, in fact, it required very little modification that uh, we have tissue prep, which goes through a standardized tissue processing, recording, filling, and then the data goes for staining, and then eventually 3D reconstruction of the anatomies as well. And then we also have computational efforts to do, uh, to do neuronal modeling. So we've now been applying this platform to work on the human tissues, where if a human piece of tissue comes in, we train the entire team onto working on that human tissue to sort of maximize the, the value from those tissues. And if I could uh, be permitted a, a brief uh, interlude for an aesthetic purpose here, uh, with, with all due respect to the cardiomyocyte, uh, neurons are incredibly beautiful. <coughs> and uh, I really, I think it's uh, somehow, intellectually very satisfying that the, the units that give rise to all of our diverse mental faculties are themselves very beautiful and diverse uh, to look at. Cajal called these the butterflies of the soul. However, we're neuroscientists, so we take these nuggets of beauty and we classify them. <coughs> <coughs> so that's what we're now doing. Uh, we're starting to, uh, to build a classification of these different morphological types. Um, first quant qualitatively, moving towards a more quantitative uh, classification. And uh, one thing I think we can say uh, pretty clearly is that while the general forms of these cells are fairly well conserved, here there are quantitative differences. The human neurons are significantly larger, they're significantly more complex. Uh, here are some statistics on, on some morphological features for pyramidal neurons. This has also been published by others. Uh, that the human neurons are, are much more complex. So I also wanted to say that um, 
like most big data sets we generate, um, we're trying to make all of these public as well. And we had our first data release of human neurons to go with uh, mouse data, which has been public for some time now uh, in October. And we hope that this is useful for sort of as a catalytic resource, both for the data itself, but also I think to illustrate that this can be done and the hope that more researchers in the community, maybe some of you, uh, will begin to start to try to extend on these studies. Okay, so getting back to this idea of sort of the correspondence problem. Um, something that has become clear is that we don't get the same answer with these different types of, of uh, analyses. So we might see a different variety of physiological varieties compared to anatomical varieties compared to the molecular varieties. It's not easy to put these things together if they're not directly measured at the same time. So we had to develop new tools to allow that direct correspondence. The, the first of these um, is an adaptation of the method of single cell PCR. The modern incantation, uh, incarnation of this is, has been coined patch seek. Uh, so you do a patch clan physiology experiment, you fill the cell, you extract material at the end, especially extracting the nucleus, and you sequence it. And if one already has a nice molecular classification, the computational problem becomes one of trying to map that down to a leaf on the tree. Uh, here are a few examples of this in, in the mouse for an inhibitory type, an excitatory type, where the data was very high quality, it's possible to map right down to one terminal leaf. Uh, here on the right is an example I'm particularly fond of, of a famous chandelier cell or axonic cell uh, that uh, we have morphology, we have um, physiology, and we're able to map it down to one particular leaf on the tree, which based on gene expression we had already predicted to be the chandelier type. So I hope you can imagine now that this provides now sort of a strategy where we can simply march across this tree trying to get enough data for each leaf that we can actually test this idea of whether within a leaf this is a uh, set of cells with a very low variance between them for different modalities, uh, or perhaps not. There may be surprises, as we'll see. And we've shifted this whole, basic, uh, basically our whole pipeline approach uh, from doing uh, single cell patch clamp physiology to doing single cell patch seek. Um, there are many other things you can imagine wanting to pin to this sort of molecular classification. Um, we have activities going on here for doing multi-patch physiology, as we heard, uh, even doing calcium imaging, where you are able to measure the function of many cell types at once. And you'd like to have methods that allow you to identify the molecular type of those cells and pin the phenotypes on those types. Uh, and to do this, we need a method that allows you to, to do a sort of a multiplexed assay on tissue sections following these types of experiments. Uh, these types of methods are now sort of generically referred to as, as uh, spatial transcriptomics, but they're essentially multiplexed assays on tissue sections. And we've actually made quite a bit of progress now uh, on developing these methods. Um, since the movie is too fascinating, I'll start there. Um, so uh, on the right-hand side here is, is a thick physiology slice uh, where um, the, uh, we've used a, a technique called hairpin chain reaction to label a small set of genes but penetrate through the entire slice. You can imagine combining this with fluorescently filled uh, neurons that you've done some sort of recording to. On the left is a higher multiplexing uh, locally in the cortex with a set of genes that discriminate among clusters. And I think it gives you an idea of the complexity that we're sort of dealing with, that there's all sorts of intermingled cell types labeled by these different cell type specific genes. Uh, so this is very much, I think, consistent with this sort of large set of rare types that I've been describing. And we need these kinds of methods to really get at the sort of spatial statistics and proportions of these cells uh, in these tissues. Okay, as I mentioned earlier also, the, the genetic sort of framework allows a direct transition to generating um, genetic tools. Uh, the mouse progress on this has been nothing short of spectacular to have all these different Cree lines and responder lines. And we want to have the same sorts of tools for, uh, for human. Uh, so we started to develop uh, genetic tools Viruses can, can be used to infect these cortical slices um, and introduce transgenes of various sorts. And we now have the first success um, using cell class specific enhancers to drive expression. This particular example is one of several where uh, we can get interneuron specific labeling. Um, this in of itself is kind of a, a big effort. You could imagine this even being a gene therapy tool for, uh, for epilepsy. Um, 
we've now sort of expanded this effort to try to derive more specific sets of tools. And here we've sort of run into a, an interesting observation, which is if you use mouse data and take a conserved enhancer between the two species, you almost always get a different result with the mouse versus the human enhancer. Here's one example of a sort of a serendipitous tool where using an enhancer proximal to the uh, somatostatin, somatostatin gene, this is work by our human genetics tools department, uh, you get some cortical labeling it with the mouse version. And paradoxically, with the human version, you get an incredibly restricted expression to only CA2 of the hippocampus. So just like the genes change, the regulatory elements seem to change. I and mean, it's looking like we're going to have to use human data to derive the generation of human tools um, for, the large, for the most part. OK. Um, I also want to sort of repeat a little bit of what was heard earlier today. Now that we've made such progress on understanding the components, more of the effort is going to trying to understand the connectivity between these components. And as you heard this morning, um, we're now off the ground running with a big program to try to understand the connectivity among cell types using multi-patch physiology to understand synaptic properties, the proportions and properties of connectivity. Um, I think this slide was also shown that we can do this in these human slices as well. Uh, and so we're beginning to try to, uh, to develop this strategy. It will start later this year to scale up this approach to be able to, uh, to measure these properties among different kinds of cells with the idea that in the future we'll be able to even further refine this by combining with these molecular measurements on physiology slices. Also, uh, the, the progress on EM connectomics has been truly spectacular. Uh, working with the mouse, of course, you saw this morning the progress on scaling up, moving towards an entire human cortical column. It turns out that these human tissues derived from neurosurgeries are extremely high quality as well. Uh, you can get high contrast EM material. And so you can imagine now that these methods are applicable to the human, that you could derive a complete human cortical column. It's only three times bigger, uh, which is nothing like the thousand, the orders of magnitude that they're dealing with now. And the analytical tools to be able to tease out sort of a ground truth set of morphologies and connectivity among them. So I'd like to, to sort of wrap up here, I'm almost out of time, um, to say that, that um, beyond what we've been doing here focused on the cortex, these new tools have really provided a new level of enthusiasm in the, in the community for the idea that they can be applied to understand sort of the, the diversity of cells across much larger contexts, across the entire brain through the NIH Brain Initiative, even across the entire body with the nascent human cell atlas program, that single cell transcriptomic especially are things which are very generalizable that could be used on any tissue to understand the diversity of types. And we've had the, the opportunity to participate now and to lead some of the efforts um, in mouse with the big center grant that Hong Kui Zeng uh, received, in housing all of the data through Mike Harlitz, who won the, um, was awarded the Brain Cell Data Center, uh, and a strong effort in human as well, where the, the effort now is to bring larger groups of people to tackle these big problems. On um, the human, we've tried to recruit experts in um, single cell transcriptomics, as well as the few other labs that routinely do human slice physiology to, to team up on these things and to standardize methods and build big enough data sets that we can actually tackle the diversity of the human cortex. Uh, we've also started to participate in the Human Cell Atlas through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative funded pilot projects, uh, where we've actually brought an even bigger team together to start to standardize these methods of spatial transcriptomics. This is a little of the Wild West. There are many different flavors of these methods at the moment. And so we're trying to, to bring this entire community together to try to test this idea that we can map these transcriptomic types back onto tissue sections, both in mouse and human. The idea that uh, together, uh, we can go much further than, than any group alone in developing standards and hopefully methods that are broadly applicable across many different labs. OK. So then the final slide, I'd just like to, to sort of say where I see some of the big challenges and opportunities in, in human brain research going forward. And part of this is inspired by the things that are possible in the mouse, the parts that we haven't been able to do in the human so far. Um, one of these is, of course, what are these cell types doing? What is the function of these different cell types in vivo? Uh, 
This is something you'll hear a lot about tomorrow in the context of the Brain Observatory. Um, but how can we get to understanding the function of human cell types in vivo? Uh, there are lots of studies on doing a single unit recording, uh, but being able to actually correlate this with this new level of cell type resolution is uh, still extremely challenging. The second is on long-range connectivity. There's not just a gap, there's a void of information on long-range connectivity in the human. We know almost nothing about this. From the mouse cell types program and others, we're starting to see the complexity of connectivity of individual cells that project to many different locations in the brain. But we don't even actually know much about the main fiber tracts in humans. So uh, this is a big open area uh, that needs development. And the third, which is I think kind of obvious in human, is that these tools are applicable to disease. And uh, really, the level at which many diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, for example, are tackled right now, is extremely crude. It's the level of neurons and the level of plaques and tangles that are seen with histological stains. This is an area sort of ripe for exploration with these new methods to understand the cell type specificity of disease and hopefully get at molecular mechanisms underlying those. So with, with that, I will close. I hope that I have conveyed some of the progress that we made as a, as a program and the, I think the excitement to be able to actually do these things in the real human brain. Uh, but particularly with this slide, I'd like to, uh, to thank the Institute founder, Paul Allen, for his really remarkable uh, vision, encouragement, and support, as well as now the, the uh, support of the National Institutes of Health and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for parts of this that I've described. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah, I had two fast questions. I mean, one is just thinking about some of the original Nick Spitz, recent Nick Spitzer stuff, whether you have any impression that some of these cell types that you've categorized may in fact be convertible, interchangeable, dependent on experience? Yeah, I think we, we don't have much information on that yet. Um, it's, uh, it is certainly a question from the molecular perspective of do these represent sort of stable terminal states or might some of these represent uh, some sort of a contextual state. Um, you know, for the most part, I think uh, we see them across many mouse lines in the mouse. We see them repeated across, across humans that have, we have no control over most of the things going on. So they seem to be rather reproducible, but that does not directly address your, your question. So I think it's a very good and open question, but we don't have much data to, to address it. Yeah, I guess the second question is, uh, I mean, different regions of the cortex, some are primary receptors of information from the thalamus, others are really association cortex, for example. Do you have markers that suggest differences in these sort of fundamental divisions, say association cortex versus, yeah? I, I think we're gonna start to get those answers um, as, we, as we profile more areas. So. At the moment, we have a very small number of areas, and so it's not quite possible to see whether there would be signatures. Um, on the other hand, I would say that a dominant feature that we've seen over expression profiling for some years is sort of more of a gradient across the length of the cortex, and that kind of seems to overwhelm a primary sensory per se. In fact, some of the, some of the similarities you would see between, between primary sensory areas are due to the fact that they're granular cortex that have lots of layer four neurons, and it drives sort of correlation. Once we have single cell resolution, we'll be able to ask that question in a more refined way. Um, I have, a, oh, okay. I have a quick question, um, and this gets into using transcriptomics to actually profile gene or cell types, and how that would change in the cases of disease states or in case of age. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, how are you gonna differentiate between cell types and the function of cell types? Yeah, I, I, these are all great, great questions about sort of how stable these things are, uh, which so far we've put our, our effort into trying to dive deep on understanding, you know, the sort of n normative adult case. Um, but it's a great question, you know, would they, especially if genes change as a function of any of those things and you're classifying on the, on the basis of those genes, uh, it could get quite complicated to understand that. So I don't have an answer for you, but I think, you know, the field is going to have to grapple with this as well.
So so. we heard some interesting data earlier today about um, the electrical isolation of spines. And I guess, you know, you guys are in a pretty unique position to study human spines, which are much longer than their rodent counterparts. And I was curious to know whether or not you guys have plans to do any of that work. Where's Jonathan? (coughs) It's not part of the pipeline work. Um, but these are, these are interesting questions we're considering for more smaller research science projects. But that particular one, I think we don't have something on the table right now. Um, you're, you're finding that excitatory cell types uh, vary greatly uh, from one area to the next, whereas inhibitory uh, cell types uh, were more conserved. Seems really intriguing, and I wondered if you'd sp- you've speculated on whether that's due to distinct projection patterns from different areas or perhaps distinct local computations or, or something else? Yeah, great question. So, well, as a developmental neurobiologist, that's the hat I, I wear first. Um, and from that perspective, um, there are developmental gradients across the cortical sheet during development. We see that recapitulated in bulk measurements, and the data we have now is largely two poles. <laughs> So they appear very different, but they're also at different ends of a gradient. So that may be sort of one dominating feature. But it's quite clear, um, in fact, uh, this, is, this is part of the, the work that's in a submitted bioarchive article from uh, Pasilka and Hongkui, uh, that there's a strong relationship between these types and the projection patterns. And so that's clearly a factor, but whether it's causal or whether it's, it's effect, I, I couldn't say. Uh, but there's a relationship to it for sure. I'm curious about the like the vitality of uh, human cortical tissue in uh, uh, in culture and uh, in like uh, containment so that you can use it for patching. Is this something where it, the this tissue is viable even after dissociation? Um, and is it something where like the the cells would actually stay alive uh, while patched as well for much longer than in like mouse tissue? Yeah, we should really ask the physiologists in the room. Um, So I would say I don't have anything to say about whether dissociated cells would survive longer. Uh, We've been trying, in fact, to to keep an intact circuit so that we can actually study the interactions among cells within that local circuit. Um, My intuition would be that they might also survive longer in a dissociated culture, but we haven't tested it to my knowledge. Uh, Whether you can hold a patch for longer, I don't know the answer to that either, I'm afraid. But I would suggest that you discuss this with Jonathan Ting or some of the other physiologists who've been working with the human tissue. Hey, Ed. Um, so one of the differences you always hear about between a human and, let's say, mouse cortex is during corticogenesis, humans have this outer SVZ and all these immediate intermediate progenitors that make a proportionally much bigger layer 2-3. And I'm wondering, from your data, does it look like that bigger layer 2-3 is more diverse, or is just more of the same kinds of layer 2-3 neurons? Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, we don't see that much diversity in layer 2-3, uh, despite it being so much bigger. Uh, this is not to say that there's not heterogeneity in it. And the heterogeneity, to some degree, actually seems to be continuous along the length of 2-3. to uh, So, um, you know, this is I think this is one of the places where um, we have some open questions about how to handle this data. There are, I mean, I presented this as a series of discretized types, but in fact, there are elements of continuity among these as well. Um, some of them are maybe you would question whether you should split, and others, you have a big class that can't be actually split with the methods that we're using, but there's a lot of variation within it. Layer 2, 3 falls into that category where there's quite a bit of variation within it, but it doesn't actually discretize into a variety of types. So, so, you know, I, we're still, I think it's an open question really still of how much there's going to be a correspondence between these properties. One would expect there to be more diversity in those layers simply by what's known about where they project to, um, much less an evolutionary expansion. So, uh, so I don't know. It, re- it's, it remains to be seen. That's what we're trying to test now. So do you think there's a trend that the more evolutionarily new something is, the less it can be chopped up into discrete bits. So if I you were to go totally like, unwilling to make such a statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, let's thank Ed one more time. For-